So we're going with the, what I call the go beyond Jesus loves me, this I know, uh, because you already got that. You've got it. So we're going to move on. Dot org. No, we're going to move on. In the first one uh, in the series, there's going to be four. And I know that when I sent the invitation out, I gave you the titles, the working titles. They're still going to remain the same. Number one is you ought to be teachers. And that's from Hebrews. Number two is grow up in all ways into him. Or uh, what's the King James grow up into him? Uh, number three is still from Calvary to Cavalry. Look at the spelling. That would be from the uh, the cross to uh, the return on a horse, which would be cal cal Cavalry. Got to see. I can't even say. It. And then uh, number four is Jesus the Destroyer, which I'm sure you guys all love that one, and that'll be coming up. So you ought to be teachers, right? Here we go. Do you, what are you going to teach? You want to teach the Trinity, uh, or do you want to teach you are a Jew, neither of which are in my wheelhouse? Well, it used to be, but I, the creepy picture on the left, I think, was from some medieval painter. Really creepy. But you got to go with the triangle where God is in the four, three, three parts of the triangle, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father. No, you don't. Because Come on. There's one God and one Lord. That would be God, the Father, and Jesus is the Lord. Or, no, maybe you should be teaching you are a Jew. No, Christians are not Jews, okay? So what I wanted to start with in this uh, understanding of we ought to be teachers is what are you going to teach? And we go to 2 Peter 2.1 for those of you on the phone uh, that can't see this because or but false prophets also arose among the people and this translation capitalized it the people is always israel and of course we're in two peter which is to the uh, people of israel just as there will be false teachers among you who will introduce destructive heresies i hate the heresies even denying the master who bought them bringing on themselves bringing on themselves swift destruction those would be the false teachers by the way uh and that would we, some night we'll get into the word destructive uh or to destroy apple usually it's apoluo in, in the greek which is related to those people that are going to go into the lake of fire but that's another night and then the second thing, KJV, 1 Timothy 4, 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, two of which I just gave you, right? And what I say along the way here is that sound doctrine is the imperative. Sound doctrine. And you've, you've heard Paul in uh, any number of ways in his exhortation to uh, churchgoers and, and more explicitly to Timothy, that doctrine is, is the key, the doctrine. And here, I've just given you a couple. There is five or six great uh, things in Timothy and Titus. Uh, I think it's in the Greek. It's the word is faithful, uh, but they don't treat it that way all the time. I think maybe REV does, the uh, revised English version. Uh, but here we're just going to read First Timothy. I gave you two here from, from the first epistle of Timothy, First Timothy 4, 6. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you, Timothy, will be uh, a good servant of Christ, Jesus, constantly nourished in the words of the faith and of sound or good kalas, doctrine good doctrine so there's got to be bad doctrine which you have been following so that's timothy following paul's teachings and then first timothy 6 3 later on he goes and if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words the hugiano is the greek word healthy uh, words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness. Godliness, that's um, this administration, this dispensation. But 
here, folks, don't ever be tricked into what I'm pointing to, that you think this, that this verse in 1 Timothy 6, 3 refers to just the red letters of the Gospels. It doesn't, because Jesus gave the revelation of the church epistles to the prophets. You can read that in Galatians 1, 11, and 12. Everybody knows that section, but you can't let anybody twist this verse, which they do. I got a letter way back in 2004 that tried to say, oh, dispensationalists don't treat the words of the Lord Jesus the way they should, and quoted this verse to me, and I wrote a whole article on it saying, well, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ didn't stop after the Gospel of John or in the book of Acts chapter 1. It, his words are the words of the prophets. And this is what we're talking about. Those words of our Lord Jesus Christ, not the words of Jesus of Nazareth, the words of the guy who became the Lord. So it's after the ascension, okay, or after the resurrection. Well, I remember when Peter says, you know, this same Jesus has been made Lord and Christ has been made. He wasn't always that very, very powerful. Verbs are powerful. So anyway, don't the words, sound words are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the ones that were after the book of Acts, if you will. Okay. There are some in the book of Acts, you know, Jesus talks to Paul and a few other people. So so let's get into this tonight. We're going to go into, of course, what I said was that you ought to be teachers. And we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5 and 6, part of it, just part of it. You ought to be teachers. Okay, concerning him, Hebrews 5, 11, and 12, concerning him, Melchizedek, we, that's, the, <laughs> that's Paul, we have much to say. Well, maybe Paul and, Paul and Luke, I don't know. Um, and it is hard to explain. It's hard for you guys, you Jewish people. Uh, since you have become dull of hearing. I think it, some translations hey, have slothful or slow of hearing. For though by this time, folks, you ought to be teachers, you have need, again, for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So to frame this, I'm not trying to say Hebrews wasn't written. Uh, it was written to the Hebrews, okay? Always bear that in mind because Paul uses expressions from the Hebrew scriptures till it comes out of his fingers. It's just, there are so many allusions and quotes from the Hebrew scriptures in this book that you can't just say it's, a, it's not like Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Thessalonians, Romans, Corinthians, which was you know, typically written uh, to a more Gentile congregation. This is literally to the Hebrews. Remember that when you're reading Hebrews. So explaining Melchizedek uh, is hard, and Paul takes nine and a half chapters to do so. Now, the Hebrew scriptures have two small references. The historical record, record of uh, Melchizedek coming to Abraham, that's in Genesis 14, 18 through 20, three whole verses, and then the psalmist's commentary on the Messiah in the eschaton, and Jesus, in Psalm 110, verse 4. One verse. Paul gets a little revelation to explain a little more of Melchizedek. Nine and a half chapters, folks. And we're not going to get into that tonight, but I want you to see how deep this can be. Because he's telling these, these Jews or his audience, you got to be teachers, but we got to go back and get the, get the original or the elementary principles of the oracles of God. The word oracles is logion. Uh, so what Paul says in his nine and a half chapters are part of the unsearchable riches of Christ, part of the secret, because it's not revealed in the Hebrew scriptures what he talks about and expands upon with Jesus, the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So just keep that in mind as you're going into Hebrews. If you haven't uh, guessed it, I've been in Hebrews for about a month, and uh, you, I, I can't get out. So anyway, Christians, just so you put some in context, uh, I 
since we're talking about Melchizedek, who is a king and a priest, right? He's the king of Salem, Melchizedek, king of righteousness. That's what Malki, or actually my king of righteousness, Mal Malak is the Hebrew uh, consonants, MLK, for kingship. And of course, he was the high priest that Abraham gave tithes to. Just this crossed my mind that Christians will also be kings and priests to God. Now, Israel, near the bottom, and I just gave you the two references, uh, Revelation 1.6, Revelation 5.10, in the King James. At the bottom here, Israel was to be a king of pre kingdom of priests. The whole lot, folks, not just the Levites, but it turned out that the Levites had to set the example, set the picture uh, of what a, uh, what a high priest or a priest and high priest would be. But in the eschaton, there's going to be a fulfillment of Israel being a kingdom of priests. That's, I've handled a little bit of that in uh, God is King in a Cosmic Mountain, I think it's part three. But Levites were to have no property, no personal possessions. They lived off the tithes from the people. And so now, how should we think about ourselves, right? Well, Jesus kind of laid it out for the Jews quite distinctly. Our treasure is supposed to be elsewhere. Two, if it's not in your pocket, you know, you're laying up, you know, treasures in heaven. I think that that's uh, the second bullet point there from Matthew 6. Remember, you know, the, uh, the don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. I mean, so, and then Luke here, Luke 14, 33. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. So everybody should sell everything and follow who? Jesus isn't here. Oh my goodness. And Jesus spoke at, in, in time. Jesus said to a particular set of people to do this. Does that mean you do? No, it doesn't. And we're going to look at the rich ruler for a second here because there's some great, great stuff in there. And we're still talking about how, you know, how to think as a king and a priest, specifically a priest, acts in the selling of the possessions. Remember that they sold their possessions uh, and gave the price of them at the apostles' feet. Was that Christian communism, right? Everybody just has to be one and nobody has to make any more money than anybody else. And, you know, the, if you've been in seminary, cemetery, uh, this gets thrown in your face a lot. Well, that's the way we should be in the world. No, 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 no. That was a Christian thing. That's not a world thing. If you want to try to do that for the world, you know, get them to, you know, obey the Lord Jesus Christ and then we'll talk. But it's not Christian communism. It was some of their possessions. It wasn't all of their possessions. All right. We need to take the long view as these future priests. For Christians today, it's maybe like Abraham, right? Focusing on the coming country or the city. Remember, those both things are part of the consciousness of Abraham before God, uh, you know, actually made the covenant with him. I think he knew, you know, he, he looked for the city whose builder and maker was God. Well, where's that city? It's in, it's a heavenly city. It's not, on, it's not even on earth yet. But anyway, so, you know, we'll have that permanently. So what, as I said, do we sell all we have? No, that's not our calling. That was in Jesus's time, the person he was speaking to <laughs> sort of brings me to, there's that verse that's always used by people to say, well, forgive everybody because that's what Jesus did. You know, for, you know, forgive them for they know not what they do. That, no, no, no. That's Jesus talking to the guy on the, on, the, on the cross next to him. That's not Jesus talking to everybody on God's green earth. I mean, but don't be stupid. Don't let people say, oh, just forgive them. You know, don't hold it in. Just forgive them. I don't forgive people unless they apologize and make amends for their bad decisions or bad behavior until they correct it and have remorse oh my god there's a word anyway culture and so don't do don't do the thing where if jesus told this disciple to sell everything he has that means you do just don't do that with the bible think about the culture think about situations that change we got to think it through because during jesus's time you know, you could be an itinerant preacher. Do you think that's a good thing in America in the 21st century? No, I don't think so. Yeah, you could literally pick up the stakes. That means the stakes of your tent and follow Jesus. 
we do not live in an agrarian culture or we don't also live in the ancient Near East, the A and E. You see that a lot from me. Private property is something that needs to be utilized in this day and time uh, for protection, if one thing, and for focus. If you read anything about the early uh, settlers in America, when they didn't, everything was shared. There was no prosperity. People nearly died. As soon as they made private property a thing, people cared for their homes because it was theirs. They stewarded what was given to them because they knew that God wanted them to take care of what was given. Anyway, we don't know Jesus anymore after the flesh. So how do we know him? I make this statement because, um, and I think I might even say it later, but I would say most of us here uh, listening tonight would are older. You know, we outlived Jesus. He was 30 years old, right? Um, and, you know, I'm 68. I'm, I've lived through some stuff Jesus never lived through, right? Did Jesus have OCP and lose his eyesight? Does Jesus, ever, did he ever get cancer? No. You know, and don't take that verse that says he in all ways, tempted like in all ways as we are, yet without sin. That's, <laughs> got to read the context there, folks. But think of your situation, where you are. You know, if uh, somebody listening to this in the 22nd century in Hungary might have circumstances that are totally different than the United States. But the word is faithful, and you can listen to the word and apply it in your situation. Where's Bob going? Bob's going to the rich ruler. This is just a parable, right? The ruler, a principal one. All it says is principal one in the text. I'm thinking it's probably a Pharisee. Um, question him, Jesus, saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said in him, why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone, right? You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And, of course, the leader goes, oh, all these things I've kept from when I was a baby. You know, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, okay, uh, one thing you still lack, sell everything you got. Distribute it to the poor. You shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, the ruler, the leader, the principal one, he began to be very sad. Because why? He was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, they who heard it said, oh my goodness, how can anybody be saved? But he said, these things are, that are impossible with people are possible with God. And that's the focus of tonight. It's possible with God. Peter said, behold, we've left our homes. You know, he's like, he's like thinking, well, what is he talking to me? You know, he wasn't necessarily rich, but, you know, he's worried. Peter goes, behold, we left our homes and we followed you. And he said, truly, I said, even no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come will get eternal life. This is, this is not to you guys here. I just don't, I just, this is a concept of coachability, humbleness, non-arrogance, and then not thinking you're all that and have all the money in the world so you can save yourself because you can't. Another one. In James, I thought, and notice, 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 we're staying within the scriptures that are written to Jewish people. You know, James says in chapter one, you know, to the 12 tribes, does that somehow mean he was writing to Christians? No, it says the 12 tribes. Are Christians mentioned? Yes, of course they are. But it's the 12 tribes that he is focused on. And just another example here in James, come now, you rich men, Israelite Christians, weep and howl for your miseries, which are coming upon you. Um, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. Love it. Thank you, James. In, it is the last days, you idiots, that you should have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, you rich person, 
um, and which has been withheld by you. See, there's the key. Cries out against you, and the outcry of those who are harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. He's that means in Hebrew scriptures that was the Lord of the armies. <laughs> He's coming to get you uh, with an army, by the way. Uh, you have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts. You like that? Fattened your hearts. How do you do? In the day of slaughter. <laughs> oh, gee. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord, like the farmer who waits for the precious produce of the store. He waits, being patient about it, until it gets the early and latter rains or late rains. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts. Don't let them be, what did he say here? Um, fatten them, strengthen them. Don't fatten them, for the coming of the Lord is near. Why is Bob doing this? Well, we want to be teachers. We ought to be teachers, just like Paul was telling those Jewish guys uh, at, the, at the beginning of chapter 5, or excuse me, end of chapter 5 in Hebrews. But the kind of stuff I'm getting to here tonight is be humble, be coachable, do not be arrogant, be giving, be righteous. Not in your own eyes. Okay, not the whole story, but I hope you're getting my drift here. We're not even into the part of the teaching we're getting to, but here again in James, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. What? And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Because like the flowering grass, he will pass away, both of them, by the way. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flowers fall off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So to the rich man in the midst of his pursuits, it'll fade away. And blessed is the man who preserves under trial, okay? For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Folks. This is just life. Life is a trial. There's hum those of humble circumstances. You want to call them poor. They're rich in other ways if they're smart. There are those who make money hand over fist. And you have to be humble about that. There's more about this in James. I'm not going to go through it all except for one more section. Just great active, active stuff. Practical. My brethren. Do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and is dressed in fine clothes, and there comes also a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who's wearing fine clothes and say, you sit here in the good place, in the gold chair. Oh, especially the one with the vibrating, uh, never mind. And you say to the poor man, Oh, uh, you stand over here or sit at my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? And this is what we're talking about. We've got to be righteous in our thinking, humble, coachable, teachable. Listen, my beloved brethren. Didn't God cho choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he promised to those who love him. We just read that in chapter five, right? Those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court usually do, because they have lawyers and they can pay for them? Do they not? This is America. This, that was Palestine, of course. Do they, but it's the same thing. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you've been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the royal law. You are doing well. You're doing good. But if you show per partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery but you do commit murder you have become a transgressor of the law so speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of 
liberty for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And this will come up. So from Hebrews 5.13, where we ended a little bit uh, ago, uh, when it said you ought to be teachers uh, and not, and you know, but you have one that needs to teach you again the oracles of God, and you become one who needs milk and not strong meat. So this picks it up right here in Hebrews 5.13. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Now, that is a million dollar point, and it is a you know, huge teaching about righteousness, right? That's the Bible, <laughs> if you get it right, right? The uh, practical application. Well, teaching is all about how to live before God. It really is, because there's another verse in Hebrews, one of my favorites. I'm not sure if it comes up here. Yes, I think it does, you know, that uh, everything is naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's King James. We live before God. He knows everything. You can't hide crap, people. So don't think you can. It's right living. The teaching about right, righteousness is about right living. In the dispensation of the secret, it's WWPD. What would Paul do? Okay, not Jesus, Paul. Because Jesus isn't around. There's no law. There's no temple. There's no lots of stuff that was in Judaism. We're not Jews. Remember that. But there's more. What would you do? Not just Paul, who is the, it says in Timothy, he's the exemplar. He is the pattern. Jesus had him write that, um, that he had been chosen as the pattern for those who would follow. That's the word. If you want to look at it, I think it, King James, uh, I can't remember. So I think it's pattern. But not only that, I mean, Paul lived in Palestine 2,000 years ago. What would you do in the 21st century in America? Okay, that's really where we're going with this, because you've got to be acquainted with the teaching of righteousness or right living where you are, not where Jesus was, not where Paul was, but where you are. You know, yes, Paul had amazing things to say about the secret that's not revealed in the Hebrew scriptures and you got to know it but you know do you, do you live in Palestine in the first century of Christendom no is there slavery now no was there then yes in spades some night I'll go into that as to why God allowed that it's not allowed anymore and it shouldn't be so how do you handle certain things that were said in the church epistles in 21st century America. That's, boy, that's a, a big piece of cake to, to eat. So, so we're talking about verse 14 now, but solid food is for the mature. We're talking meat, potatoes, syrup and turp, and for you Southern people, shrimp and grits, which I love. Look, we know Jesus loved us, so we go out there and get embarrassed no, 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 and, and say so, right? Because yet, yeah, yeah, yes, Yet we're deplorables, right? We're the laughing stock of the world. We're fools for Christ, but but we're not irredeemable, as Hillary said we were. Uh, yet there's more. Okay, you can't stop the redeemed of the Lord. We're there. It's permanent. Deal with it. So First Timothy two four says, "Who wants to be saved? Who wants everybody to be saved? That would be God, and come to a full knowledge of the truth." So. Solid food is coming to a full knowledge of the truth. Milk, that would be getting saved and just, you know, getting to learn how to crawl, learn how to eat. The light stuff, because you're not going to be able to swallow the heavy stuff, the surf and turf. So we go out there and we rehearse what we know, because here's the rest of that verse. Who have need of, what did we say? I go back here. Um, solid food, solid food, solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And everybody's going to know, want to know what senses is, and we'll get into that. So we go, we go out there and be devil hunters. That's what I used to be. 
No, we don't. We just teach what we know, where we know it, what we know, and we deal with the outcome. <laughs> you're older and wiser if you're mature, and you can discern good and evil. You know when to keep your mouth shut. You know when to open it. You know what to say to whom you are talking or ministering as God's servants in all situations at all times. Those of you who are meditating upon his word in your brain, you're not just flipping you know, you're not just flipping pages of your Bible and say, look, look what he said here. No, you're just talking to people. You're introducing them to the answer to every question they ever had. Anyway, those who know God are the called ones. You got nothing to worry about. You've been called and you want to do this. I know you do. You want your senses trained. You want to be out there. Um, they want that opportunity, but they aren't teenagers anymore what do you do jesus lived the 30 years old so you got to think it through the second time i've mentioned this because it's important when i was a teenager i was witnessing door to door and i was sent out as a uh, missionary if you will for six straight years while i was in college and seminary and uh i did things that i i could not do today i wouldn't do today I embarrassed myself <laughs> um, I, as I look back on it, but we do what we do where we are because we have the maturity to know what to do, okay? And you're not going door to door witnessing anymore. It's just not, I don't know, it's not in your wheelhouse, but there are just ways that you introduce God to people and it's all good stuff. But you know, don't forget that thing here at the top. Don't be, we're not going out looking for debt. We're not looking for a fight. We're, they, it'll come to you if you're doing, if you're doing stuff, you know, because the evil one knows who you are. I mean, you do speak in tongues and he knows that. And you do get up in the morning. Maybe you do read your Bible, right? Or you do uh, participate in fellowships and you do you know, things for others, and you do stretch yourself out and do things, you truth it, but your truthing it is not my truthing it. Don't, don't try to be Bob. I'm not going to be you. That was a lesson to be learned. You don't want to be the, yeah. let's be Abraham. Let's be Moses. He was a cool dude. That'll come up in a minute. So anyway, so what are we supposed to do? So we ended up with, because of practice, these mature people have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So therefore, the next verse in chapter six, verse one, therefore, if you have your senses exercise, oh, I didn't go over senses. Let me go over senses here. That's not our senses. <laughs> their senses are not our senses. They didn't know the senses. This was the there's, this is the only time this, this word is used in Greek in the entire uh, Christian scriptures. It's used in the book of Maccabees, I think maybe Jeremiah, once here in the Christian scriptures. It's the organ of mental perception. They don't know senses like we have the quote-unquote five. We say there's five. Maybe there's ten. You know, we're guessing. That's a construct. But their constructs aren't ours. They had their sense. They're if I use the word feelings, it might get closer to the word here. Uh, senses, it's uh, the, 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 the organ of mental perception. What comes into your brain? <laughs> and you know what? Maybe it's the still small voice. Maybe it's the voice of Jesus that told you what to do uh, a year ago and you remembered what that, here it is, felt like it's a good thing. Because if it feels like that again, it might be Jesus again. And you can train yourself to feel it. <laughs> and we're not going into the force here, folks. But we can have our, our organ of mental perception. That would be, we call it the brain, the mind, the heart, the guts, which every one of those is used in the Hebrew scriptures. And they didn't, you know, their heart wasn't our heart. Their gut wasn't our gut. They had all kinds of different ideas of what those things were. So they did also with the word senses, which what, what we translate as senses. It's the, uh, as I say, the, almost, the word almost is right to call it feelings. There's probably some complicated, 
go to your lexicon. It's, it's interesting to read what the word senses to be trained. So therefore, once you have your, your senses trained to discern good, good, good and evil, leave. Get out of here. No, verse, verse one says, we therefore leaving. And here's the move it, move past, get past. Jesus loves you, okay? Move beyond the elementary teachings about the Christ and press on to maturity. Not laying again. Here, here we go. The foundation of one, repentance of the dead, good, dead works. Two, on, and faith toward God. Three, instructions about washing. Four, laying on of hands. Five, resurrection of the dead. Six, eternal judgment. Some people put each of the two, you know, numbers one and two together, three and four together, five and six together. That's another teaching. But in order to press on to maturity, Paul is telling these Jews to move on beyond elementary teachings about the Christ. Now, the Christ to them, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's different, but it's they knew a lot about the Christ, okay? So we're going to go into this. It doesn't say, by the way, that we're supposed to leave this stuff in the dust or expunge it from our memories. It says move beyond it. Leave it. You know, Put it in the rear view mirror for just a bit. It's going to stay there. doesn't go away because in this we will do. If God permits, what, what will we do? We'll go on to maturity. If God permits, that might be like, we might come back uh, real soon. So let's go into it. Repentance, number one, we're supposed to move on from the repentance from dead works. Now, Paul speaking to Jews here, okay? But we can understand it in relationship to 21st century America and the dispensation of the secret uh, more fully understood in later sections of the Bible. Not fully understood here in, in Hebrews. And that's a, that's a lesson and a half. I was talking today to Michael that, you know, Galatians and Hebrews, uh, because Galatians and Hebrews were often in, in the manuscripts, uh, in, in a couple of canons, pardon me, not in the manuscripts, but in a couple of canons. Uh, one of them is the Sahedic. Uh, it's a, that's an, Ethio uh, an Ethiopic language of the Southern Nile. Their church had Galatians, Hebrews, then Ephesians. So in other words, there was Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Hebrews. And then Ephesians. And, and we think that Hebrews was a fairly early book, not a late one for sure, because he's going over, he's talking to the Jews and saying, you know, you guys ought to be teachers and not just, you know, you ought to, you know, move on, move past what you know, because, you know, some of them were born again. I don't think all the addressees in the book of Hebrews were born again. That's an important lesson. But in essence, it goes, it, the book of Hebrews goes to the heart of Judaism, the law. Paul is talking to the Hebrews. And here's their, usually this was their attitude. If I just do the law, I'll make it, right? So said the young Pharisee in his attempt to be righteous. You know those types. You know, if I go to the right school, if I read the right books, if I wear the right clothes, if I say the right things, you know, politically correct things, and if I stand in a certain way, That'll make me righteous in front of, in front of maybe the proletariat. Um, so the second thing we have to move past or these Jews had to move past was faith toward God. So it says, you know, move, move past, uh, move past repentance and now move past faith toward God. Well, aren't, aren't those integral to our salvation? Yeah. And how are we supposed to move past uh, faith for, faith to God. Wait a minute. Even this one has got to be laid aside, or should I say, put in the rearview mirror. I said that once, but the text doesn't say, forget the elementary teachings. It says what it says. Move beyond this, you know, repentance from dead works and faith. You've got this. You've got that. You, you here in the dispensation of the secret, you've got it. It's permanent salvation that's what paul mentions in the book of hebrews on this great salvation he calls it in the chapter two right so not only that we move we, paul's telling these jews to move beyond the instructions 
uh, about washings. And if you can read Greek, there it is, baptismos. Even you non-geeks or non-Greeks can see what Paul's saying here. It's deeper than just baptisms because baptisms are not in the Hebrew scriptures. They are literally washings. Uh, you know, John the Baptist and Jesus turned those washing to, washings into something that they could use for their preaching in Palestine in the first century. Does that mean you should be teaching baptism? No, that's even further. No, because there's really only the one left and that's spiritual. But Jews here are being addressed. And they had ritual washings that followed the Mosaic law. Drop it all. Move along. That's what he's telling to these people. Um, what did I say here? Oh, I, did, I already went over this. That uh, I didn't go over Peter and James, though. But Peter and James are also early books. Okay, Galatians is the earliest epistle written by anyone in the Christian scriptures. You may have been told it's Thessalonians. No. Thessalonians was very late. I don't know if there's reasons why you were taught that. It's not what we're going into tonight. Some, if you want to ask me why, everybody, every scholar that I know thinks Galatians is early. Peter's early, James is early, book of Revelation is early. Um, and I'll say one thing that <clears throat> the relationship to the current dispensation with the full canon of scripture related to it and that is that John the Baptist and eventually, uh, eventually Jesus pointed to a superior baptism than the physical one. You guys all know the scriptures. And of course, Paul picks it up in Ephesians 4, 5 and says there's still, there's only the one. And we know darn well, it's not the works one. It's not the one where you've got to dip somebody in water. Never what, you know, never, that never gets you righteous. It's just, it was an outward sign, but no longer is there the works baptism. It's a spiritual baptism. How does one, how does someone disregard that though? Well, again, text doesn't say we disregard it. We just move beyond it, right? Holy smokes. And then we also move beyond the laying on of hands, uh, which, which in the Hebrew scriptures de designated blessing, sometimes ordination, but certainly an authority being passed on. The Jewish thing, Isaac with Jacob, Esau, or Moses with Joshua, to have these Jews put in the rear view mirror things like this, you know, this kind of action, which, which gave, you know, gave this authority to the next person. Like, you know, we're going to follow Joshua now. And we're going to follow, well, first we're going to follow Isaac, or no, Abraham, then Isaac, now Jacob, you know, then Moses, and then Joshua. The hero worship was um, yeah, incessant. So yes, Messiah had come. How do you move beyond those other dudes, the guys that are in chapter 11 of Hebrews, right? Messiah had come. The heroes of the faith were now to be everybody. You're not supposed to follow the Bob Wasson School of Theology. You're not supposed to follow the John Lynn, the John Shane Height, the whoever you're following. <laughs> They're great teachers, I'm sure. But you need to become teachers. You need to move on. Yep. Move beyond hero worship. It's up to you to grow up and take the bull by the horn. <laughs> Too many idioms in American speech. And the last one is we're supposed to, right? Move past the resurrection of the dead. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Paul. <laughs> What's going on here? We're waiting for the resurrection of the dead. What are you talking about? Well, raising someone from the dead or more properly moving beyond the idea. How do you do it? And what type of resurrection do you think Paul is talking about with the Hebrews. He's speaking to the Hebrews about the one they knew about. Now, I don't, I don't even know if the rapture is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. It, it might be. But what I do know is that they, they knew about the resurrection of the just and the unjust. I say it right there. Paul is telling his audience to move past that. Okay, how? Why? Where? where? They're already there. Meaning... You've got to move past it because you can't worry about it. You've got this, Jews, and, and conversely, you Christians here in America in 21st century, you've got it because you're in the rapture. You know, yeah, and this section we'll get into about how you could possibly fall off the road. And, you know, some people say, lose your, lose your religion, lose your salvation. But Paul is trying to get these Jews to focus on the fact that they're there. 
they've got it. If they're walking with him, if they're walking with the Lord, if they're getting past all these, like the things that they already know, then they can move on to maturity. And you've got this, you've got the rapture, you've got permanent salvation. I know they didn't, but you've got the rapture. They have the promised resurrection. If they're walking, if they're righteous, if they continue to meditate upon his word, they've got it. So where are we going with this? Well, eternal judgment is the last thing, along with the former phrase, the resurrection from the dead. These two particularly Jewish ideas must be moved past in order to enter into his rest into the rest. Can you rest? <laughs> yeah. uh, I know I have this picture here, but they needed to have, and you need to have trust that you're okay, that you're on the way, that you're in like Flint, that you're one of God's elect. So did the Jews at that time. And you can't, you can't rest if you're constantly looking over your shoulder to see if the grim reaper has pulled your tag and he's about to be next in line at the deli. Can you? No, you can't. What is he looking at? What does it say at the bottom here? Uh, that dead thing in the corner looks good. You don't want to be that dead meat that the Grim Reaper's, you know, going to buy. You don't want to be alive to God. It's just you want to be alive to God. You want to be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and moving on, moving on. <clears throat> and why do we do that? You know, you know, Maybe we could fall off the road, but we're trying to stay on it. And here's the next little lesson for in the case of those who've been once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Those are believers, right? And then have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify themselves the Lord, the Son of God, and put to him to an open chain, okay? So how do we deal with this? I don't want to do a whole teaching on why this is not loss of salvation, but the first key might be the word, it's impossible to renew them. Well, if you were to lose salvation, of course you'd want to regain it, so why does Paul say it's impossible to renew them? That's just logic, folks. It isn't impossible in the sense that those people who are teaching a non-permanent salvation want this to be read. Um, so if they have fallen away, and it's literally the word falling beside, doesn't mean like falling into the pit, and never being able to get out again, or falling into the jar of mayonnaise and never being able to reach the rim. Um, it's just falling beside, you know. If those, this and this is a test case, it's a case, folks. It doesn't say it happens all the time. Paul saying, for those, in the case of those who once were enlightened, right? I've seen the light, uh, had tasted the heavenly gift. What's the heavenly gift? Holy Spirit. I've been partakers of the Holy Spirit. That's even deeper. Tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Did you know that you have the first fruits of the Spirit? You don't have, you don't even have the whole ball of wax. You got the first fruits. The powers of the age to come are going to blow you away if you ever look at what they would be like. Uh, Paul, uh, John, the, John says it in, in his chapters in the, in, in the Gospels, you know, it's pretty powerful stuff. And if this is an if statement by Paul, you would think that there would be some way back if that was what he was talking about. He's not. He's just talking about those who have fallen aside. And it's in the works category, folks. It's not in the, uh, the salvation category, right? For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation, uh, useful to those <clears throat> who, for whose sake it was also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed. And it ends up being burned, right? But beloved, we are convinced that's, persuaded is another word uh, of better things concerning you why because they're permanently saved okay and the things that accompany that salvation though we're speaking in this way as a case as a, as a case if you will all right the things that are accompanying our sal salvation is what paul is talking about in this context not the salvation itself but it 
because that's a done deal. That's just a done deal. If you if you got any question about it, John Shane had has a tremendous uh, appendix in the REV translation slash commentary. You can get it online. Great piece of work, folks. Anyway, the things that are accompanying salvation is the doing of stuff, you know, putting, moving past all of those things we just read about for the Jews. And then, you know, working and love is what I'm going to say it is, right? Uh, I say it's work and love because it comes up in the next verse and the next page here. But look, here's the great salvation. How shall we, my Jewish audience, you know, escape if we neglect this stuff? Okay, the great salvation. So great salvation, which at first began to be spoken of by the Lord when he was in the temple at 12 years old. He wasn't the Lord then. No, 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 no. Read what's written, which was first spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. Okay, he was the Lord after Pentecost. He wasn't the Lord before. Okay, or the Lord, you want to say, you want to say resurrection? Fine, I don't care. He wasn't the Lord until God made him the Lord. He wasn't the Lord in the Gospels. Oh, but they, he was the Lord, Jesus. We could tell he was never going to make a mistake. We know that. Well, no, God didn't know that. You don't know that. He was tempted. He was brought up to the mountain by Satan. And he could have, he wasn't a robot. But after the day of Pentecost, he could have sinned. That's the whole thing. That's why he's a man. That's why he's big. That's why he's huge, because he could have sinned. He might not have been the Lord, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane. If there's any way, please take this from me. Good Lord, he's sweating tears as if they were blood, right? Jesus could have sinned. But after he's the Lord, he talked about a secret thing, the great salvation. Oh, my goodness. And, and then it was spoken to him, spoken to them and confirmed by us or unto us by them that heard him. And, you know, people are still hearing from the Lord Jesus Christ today, every day. OK, may not be right in scripture, but they're listening. So <clears throat> it's about work and love, folks. That's the whole focus of this teaching, if you will. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love you had shown towards his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the holy ones that's the saints the believers right and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence there's the work so as to realize the full assurance of the hope until the end the complete confidence it's the folk you know it's the hope folks you'll get to this well we will we'll just keep reading so that you will not be love that word sluggish you know, you're not going to be left behind. You're going to move on. You're going to move past. Jesus loves me. This I know because you know it. But imitators of those who faith through faith and in patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, nobody's greater than God, the most high. There were some lower gods, but he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply you. That's Abraham's promise. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. See, some of the promise, basically not all of the promise because he doesn't have the land and he doesn't have the king. Well, that's the Davidic covenant. So and again, it's about doing it because you have the hope. You're there. You remember I said that you the, the, the Jews, they've even with the resurrection of the just and the unjust, they've got this because they've here. Paul says you got to focus on the hope until the end. It's always looking forward. Sounds like the, that movie, The Robinsons. I can't remember. It's a cartoon. It's a very good one. Um, anyway, keep reading here. For men swear by one greater than themselves and with them an oath given as a confirmation is an end of every dispute. It's thus said the Lord. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, uh, Israel, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to deny, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold or seize, that's the word seize, the hope, 
set before us. I mean, Jews had the hope of the resurrection and the judgments. We have the rapture and standing before God in heaven. Israel didn't have that. But this hope, verse 19, we have as an anchor of the soul. This is when he's talking about Christians here. A hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. What? You know, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever after, according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, this is funky language, folks, and I know it is. But as I told you, on maybe the first or second slide, Paul takes nine and a half chapters to explain Melchizedekian priesthood and Jesus being the forerunner going through the veil, which is in heaven's temple, not down here on earth, and dragging. We get to go in, I almost said dragging. We get to walk in after him. After the rapture, we go into the Holy of Holies. And it's funky language. And it's usually, if it's funky, you know, I say weird is good. Funky in the Hebrew, or the Christian epistles is usually about the secret of God. And here it is. Definitely about something that was unknown before Paul wrote it here, that Jesus was a forerunner. That's nowhere in the Hebrew scriptures because, and he enters into the veil in the temple in heaven. Where's that? It's not in the Hebrews. It, the, the only place I was talking to Michael about this today, there's only a couple places where it talks about Jesus being seated at the right hand of the father, right? That's Psalm 110, until I, you know, I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. And then there's that one in, in Daniel chapter seven, where the, uh, the um, son of man comes toward the ancient of days and he gets power and authority in the kingdom. And that's, we believe is that's when he, uh, Jesus goes to the father and the father gives him uh, the go sign to come back to earth. But this stuff about Melchizedek and we who have taken refuge has to do with the horns of the altar. This is again, Hebrew idioms, uh, Hebrew uh, illusions the horn of the altar in the cities of refuge we who've taken refuge take hold of the hope the way that the the person who went to the cities of refuge took hold of the horns of the altar look that up it's a great great mind picture well we you know have the a same hope it's an anchor to us but it's what gives us the way to live righteously to enter into rest and not be looking for the grim reaper over our shoulder oh i might stub my toe and i might make it i might not make it into the resurrection of the just says a hebrew saint and then some stupid person has taught some christian that the you know the 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 the, the resurrection has happened already and you missed it so you must have really screwed up and lost your salvation it's all in here folks it's another three or four hours teaching but Please, from this last, this is the last slide for tonight, uh, understand that Paul here in this section where it says we ought to be teachers, when he first says those Jewish people ought to be teachers, you have one to teach you the you know, first principles of the oracles of God, and that you put aside all these things, what you think are probably needing to be really on the forefront, in the front burner of your stove, they don't. Move on and, you know, Take, take hold of the hope. If you take the hope, if you learn the end of the end, you know, that would, everything about the hope. I mean, I know that Jesus is the destroyer is the last of the, in the series, but that's part of the hope when Jesus comes to earth and kicks butt and takes names. He doesn't come back blowing kisses, folks. It's part of our hope. Lake of fire, part of our hope. God killing evil people, part of our hope justice you know no justice no peace both coming with the lord jesus christ so that's it for tonight and i will show you the next grow up into him is the next one um, and uh, we'll get into that in a week or so so i'm stopping sharing i'll leave on the uh the my the uh, recorder and you guys can ask questions or talk about this if you would like Hello, Bob. It's Ron. Um, hey, Ron. Hi. Uh, hope everybody's doing great tonight. All right. Um, 
you mentioned something, and I heard something whenever I was listening to the, the Hebrews 5 and 6 uh, prior to our little get-together here. And it had, uh, 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 in fact, it was something there on your very last slide on uh, Hebrews 6, 20, or 6, 26, or something like that. And said something about that uh, uh, Jesus was the, uh, 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 the the high priest, and because we are in, the, does that kind of make us high priest too? Uh, yeah, I said that about the second or third uh, slide. We are his brothers. He's king of kings. We are kings, and he's you know the high priest. But we get to go into the holy of holies. Uh, says so in a number of places that we follow him in, in heaven, yeah. which is where God lives. He lives in the temple, in the Holy of right. Holies. So, yeah, if you want to call us a high priest, I don't think it explicitly says that in Scripture, but it says it in a number of ways that we do enter the Holy of Holies in heaven. So the only person who was allowed to do that was the high priest. Yeah, and, and I I just add to that, Bob. We're we're not a protocol. We're not a protocol. We're not a we're not the type. Jesus is the protocol. He's the first of a type in the order of his body. So so that makes him unique in that fashion because we're made after his image. Uh, he he was the first of those to come after, and seeing how we are the ones coming after. Yep. It sounds like uh, many, go ahead. It sounds like that we are some that are coming after, uh, like the uh, 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 Melchizedek type uh, priest. Uh, yes, there. You know, I I don't want to sell I don't want to sell us short because it says God brings many sons to glory. We are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are heirs together. It says we we do enter the Holy of Holies with him. I mean, there's you got to get your sights up, I think. you got to really think highly of yourself. That it, it, Not smugly, but highly. And, and I know right, that right. We, we so often don't. We, 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 you know, because, we, because so many people have taught us and we have in the back of our minds that he's the God man. Yeah, that we can't do what he did. Jesus said to his disciples, not even Christians, that you know the things that I do, you shall do in greater. And we right. don't think, and exactly. we don't, and that's not even that's not even in our administration. That's he was looking towards the power of the age to come, which was going to be greater than his. Okay, so right. how does that work? You know, but for Christianity. We have a fabulous, we have a fabulous future. We have a fa and don't don't feel queasy about saying you are like Mike. You're like the Lord Jesus Christ. You are. You know you'll have okay. bodies like unto His glorious body. He's the firstborn of the dead. That means there's more. Okay. Yes. And, it's lovely. Yeah, and this is one. Of, I, I believe that one of the ways that that I'm helping to get rid of some of that past stuff is to come to a realization of that which is and we are who uh, God says we are and so if that's who we are then you know kibosh the rest you know and <laughs> yeah, very yeah. very humbling of course but you know but it, to, to give that a, a I, I don't like using the word reverence but you know of, of what that position actually is is and we are it and if i see that and work in my head and heart and all of that then it helps to i think put things into proportion of of what is meant i agree agree paul just jump in you don't have to i, I can't really see when people raise their hands so jump in okay um this is the first time i've actually ever heard the fact that we are going to as the body of Christ be entering into the inner of inners of the temple that is in heaven in Zion that God lives in. I never heard that before, but it makes a lot of sense. And to just 
you know, continue this conversation is like, why wouldn't we be allowed in? I mean, we are brothers. We are of Jesus. We are joint heirs. We are sons of God. God did this, all of this planning before the foundations of the earth was ever laid. From what I understand, why wouldn't he let us home? He wants us to be there. He wants us to receive our rewards. He wants us to get our crowns. He wants to teach us, I guess, maybe how to fight the adversary in the future or whatever is going to happen. But he wants us there. And that makes perfect sense that we are so privileged as a Christian to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies. That's just amazing, I think. Hey, Bob, I love the comment about... uh... He wasn't Lord when he was in when he was going it was in that when he was twelve years old. He didn't get his lordship until after he was raised from the dead. Because I love that that phrase. His last three words of his life was "It is finished." He accomplished everything he was set out to accomplish as the seed of the woman and going through that suffering part. And I've thought a lot about that recently. It is finished. It's done. And then you, when you're talking about moving on, it's finished. Move on. Come on. Yeah, that's beautiful. It, it's yeah. just, uh, and, I, and I thought about get a grip. Uh, you know, yeah. it's it's a, uh, it's just I just love that part because he, he he God didn't give him that name above every name until after it is finished. Right. And he couldn't say that until God said, "You can now say that it's finished." Yeah, agree. I just yeah. I just I mean he was the mightiest hero of all time. He wasn't a robot. He went through so much. He makes him the greatest hero of all time. And we've all read books about the great heroes in military, whatever. And what he did is just, he's the hero of all heroes. It just blows my mind how incredible that man Jesus Christ is. Yeah. And we're supposed to move move, move past it, move beyond it. That is like, what? <laughs> Get so it? with that... Is the uh, the the growth potential that we have in our understanding, and then also the vision that God and our Lord Jesus Christ is attempting to build for us, for each one of us, and that uh, to be able to enter into the Holy of Holies and enter in and, and become priests and kings. That's quite a vision. I mean, oh, just look, just look yeah. at that. I, I I'm almost I'm almost breathless <laughs> thinking about that, yeah. and, and we absolutely not... yeah we did not earn any of that. Absolutely. Although we will earn rewards, but we didn't earn that privilege. So just think only by believing it, it. right? Only well, just... only by believing it, yeah. accepting well, yeah. it, right? The acceptance of it. But I right. love that I see tonight is that our vision is being built in our hearts and minds yeah. to be able to, mm-hmm. you know, endure in this age currently and then see what hopefully we'll have our vision built more of what's going to happen in the future for us. Oh. So, and, us so. and all we had to do was believe. Yeah. And yeah. it became a gift. Yeah, we didn't work yeah. for it, right? Yeah. And we right. can't lose and we can't lose it. <laughs> didn't yeah. work. Yeah. We can't work hard enough to lose it. We didn't work hard enough to get it, so you know it's it's hard to have the hope as an anchor when you when you when you are living a life that says the anchor could be moved, you know <laughs> that that the that it could slip. That there's a possibility. kind of defies defies the definition of an anchor. Yeah, exactly. right. And hope. And hope. That you right. passed away. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Oh, no. So let me ask anyone who might have an understanding. Um, does the church have a place in destroying the dragon? Come on, you guys. I'm gonna say yes. They all say uh, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah too. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. We'll be coming back as an army as as the army or some of the army, right? Yeah, we just we'll be coming around that mountain when we come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> we'll be uh, since we're part of the body of Christ. We'll be the transformers. There yeah. you go. That's yeah, there we go. Michael <laughs> likes that, right? Here. Yeah, we're and that's here. why you brought up Hebrews eleven nine. Was it thirty nine? Thirty nine, right? About um, you know, it talks about us as the church, you know, helping or doing, having some part of the fulfillment or the completion you know of, of the israel whatever god promised to israel and that gives us another reason for the hope is that our participation not only in destroying the adversary but our participation you know in the future beyond that well, there's also those verses that say you know what the glory we're going to have compared to the glory that moses had that moses glory was no glory at all it also says in Romans that all creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Uh, it wants us to move along. Get on now. <laughs> Put Satan under your feet, judging yeah, angels. Don't quit. you know you will judge the oh, world? Yeah. I, mean, uh, yeah. I mean, these are all very significant to that, too. We'll get to do a whole lot of fun things. I think so. I'm just starting to ask the question. Really, what is the purpose of the church? We got Why the, are... the secret. That's that's the yeah. purpose. It, it was kept enough, a secret. It was big enough that God kept it a secret. Didn't even tell yeah. the Messiah. Yeah. Now I know. And so he, how fortunate are we? Huh? And he handed it to us. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't think I understand how important we are. Me either. We're, but we're I'm just, trying to figure it out. Yeah. We're just. I think we're just starting. Um, to 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 dig out those you, know, you call them unsearchable riches of Christ, you know they weren't they weren't they weren't there until he was the Christ, and they were unsearchable. And you know, just we saw a couple tonight, only a couple, and and we were, it's just like the Melchizedekian priesthood, nine and a half chapters, and there's like four in the Hebrew scriptures, and Paul just if you read Hebrews. And you got to do it in multiple translations because there's so many tricksy words. They you can almost make it say what you want, you know. Right. And uh, this, I think that this whole thing uh, as to the covenant: are we in the new covenant? Or aren't we in the new covenant? I think that is almost as big of a deal as the Trinity. Yeah, because yeah. because think- most all of Christianity thinks God's a Trinity. And I think that most all of Christianity thinks we're in the new covenant now. Mm. The covenant, the covenant is Rome in Romans 11. Um, Romans 11, um, all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remo- will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. With them. Yeah, yeah, them, Israel. Israel. That's yeah. It was with Israel. And, and that it, hasn't and it, happened yet. And no. if you say if you say that, that Christianity is in the new covenant, then you are saying you're a Jew. Oh yeah. <laughs> which which doesn't doesn't fly. You know, well, it, it does with most of Christianity. I know. It doesn't yeah. just the craziest. Yeah. It does. Well, they said there was gonna be a remnant or people hanging around. Just, you know, it was just that one more thing where we get to maybe have the eyes of seeing and the ears of understanding that God lays on us, you know. The words were said last night that Jesus Christ inaugurated the new covenant. So that that word was used, Bob, in, inaugurated. I, I know. It's, it's taught. The word inaugurated is probably uh, so misused by more people out of the book of Hebrews than anybody I know or any other word I know um, and you you've read it. I've sent you a couple of things Rob but the um, you know does it mean it was started does it mean it was celebrated does it mean it was dedicated which all of those translations are used for the Greek word that is often translated inaugurated for us here in America that means all oh, was started well that's not mm-hmm. what it means in Hebrew <laughs> it's not what it means in Greek and anyway, you're, yeah, you're all saying exactly the stuff that needs to be said, you know, that needs to be logic, just like dislodging the Trinity, 
it just needs to be logic and understanding the full scope of scripture and same way with the dispensation of the secret and what Christians really are as opposed to what we are so often told we are you know we're spiritual Jews um, it has nothing to do with that there's just an under there's you know there's so many things that were not in the Hebrew scriptures that the Christian prophets explain and they're so different from the way Israel was that you know there's the sleight of hand though where where cunning men lie in wait to deceive where you know just by a few verses here what do they call them um, there's there's a term called eisegesis reading into isa into the text rather than letting the text you know exegesis right and then there's the uh, they call it proof texting you know you pull one verse out and you laud that thing to the sky and it becomes your theology so yeah Galatians 6.16 is one of those. And, uh, anyway, um, I think we're, we're conveniently late enough, right? So yep. um, thank you for all coming.